I have been attacked by animals uh, for 40 years, beginning in, uh, in high school when I worked at a veterinary clinic. In, I started in the kennels and I learned how to protect myself from angry dogs with a squeegee. Then moving to the front of the clinic, I worked with the, uh, the doctor and learned the art of restraining angry cats. From there, I went to college and worked in several laboratories with rats and fearful rats and fearful mice that were willing to use their incisors um, when mishandled. But none of that prepared me um, to work with these creatures. The gorilla critids. The gorilla critid looks like a cross between a grasshopper and a cricket. And I had worked at the University of Wyoming for several years on grasshoppers. And I had uh, the opportunity to take a sabbatical in Australia and work on their cousins down under, uh, the gorilla critids. Now, grasshoppers uh, can be a bit feisty, but the gorilla critids, um, they can be absolutely fierce. When they perceive themselves as threatened, they flare up their wings, and then they drum their abdomen against the substrate like a war drum, and then they flare their mandibles to give you no doubt as to what their intentions might be. Going to a new place to conduct studies on a new animal with new methods took me back in my memory to my early days in graduate school at Louisiana State University. My first course in graduate school with, was with Dr. Jeff Lafage. It was a course in insect behavior, which was going to be my specialization. Dr. Lafage, his area of expertise in particular was uh, the termites, but he was really a Renaissance man. Uh, Dr. Lafage uh, collected Tiffany glass um, and he also had a, uh, a radio program, a Baroque music radio program on public radio. Dr. Lafage was a phenomenally intimidating and gentle man. I think he was constitutionally unable to harm a fly, but if you came to his class as a graduate student and you had not prepared your reading, he would look over the top of his wire-rimmed glasses and you would tremble for very good reason. Dr. Lafage taught us that behavior is how an animal perceives itself in its environment, uh, mediated through evolution and experience. Now with insects, experience plays a small role. Most of their behavior is driven by instinct. For instance, the ants, when they detect carbon dioxide, they perceive that their environment, their nest has been, has been breached by a mammal which is bad news if you're an ant, and so CO2 causes them to attack. They go into an attack mode, figuring that there's a threat to their survival. Dr. Lafage also taught us um, that insects had, had evolved a whole series of fantastic armaments. Um, he loved walking us through the mouth parts that were variously adapted to crush, dismember, slice, and pierce flesh and tissue, um, modifications in the reproductive organs of insects that were adapted for stinging or for injecting venom. Dr. Lafage also showed us how the social insects, the ants, bees, bees and termites, had evolved a capacity to recognize one another in order to ratchet down their violence. They could smell a nest mate, and in the darkness of a nest, if another organism didn't smell right, it was torn to pieces. Um, so they had a social mechanism to diminish their level of violence. The non-social insects, such as the gorilla critids, have no such mechanism to restrain or constrain their violent tendencies. When they encounter one another, it's a, um, it's a bloodbath. Dr. Lafage was a bioeconomic hardliner. He believed that the currency of evolution was the gene, and the more copies of your gene you got into the next generation, the richer you were in biological terms. But it was when he spoke of his daughters, of his next generation, of his genes, 
that he belied his evolutionary dogmatism because it was so clear when he spoke of his own children that he was deeply and madly in love with his girls. But when speaking of insects, he would allow no such subjectivity. The goal of the insect behaviorist was a hard-driving, cold-hearted objectivity. That's what it was to be a good scientist. He had no sympathy for creatures in the natural world. They were doing what they had evolved to do, including living and dying. Of course, for most creatures, um, life and death is the ultimate scorecard which explains why predators have only about a 10% success rate in bringing down prey. You see, if a predator fails, it goes hungry. If the prey fails, it dies. And so Dr. Lafage would share with us a litany of sort of last-ditch efforts that the insects had, have evolved when confronting predators, beetles that would spontaneously bleed, crane flies that would lose a leg and have it just twitch to distract a predator, and of course, moths that would flash eye spots that looked like an owl in order to startle a predator. He taught us that an organism put in a nothing-to-lose position would go to extreme measures. The lessons he gave me played out powerfully when I was in Australia. The gorilla critids are solitary, highly territorial organisms. It's only when they need to mate that the adults actually come together. You see, they are opportunistic predators, primarily scavengers, but when they encounter a vulnerable individual, they will tear it to shreds. Um, which meant that when I worked with them in the laboratory, I had to cage them separately. If you put more than one gorilla critted in a cage, at the end of the day, you have one gorilla critted in the cage. One of the things I researched while I was there was the silk um, that these produce from their mandibular glands. They use the silk to line their burrows and to bind their leafy nests. And to collect their silk, I would take a, a glass probe and sort of nudge them out of, out of their hiding spot. Um, I remember one day this large gorilla critic began that abdomen thumping, right? That was a warning that aggression was about to begin. Its next move was to snap off the end of the glass probe with its mandibles. And a gorilla critted, once it began this fearful defensive attack, it would press that attack with absolutely reckless abandon. It was unable to temper its rage in proportion to its size. A, a, a cricket-sized gorilla critted would rear up, right, and snap its mandibles at an intruder 10,000 times its own size. Um, the largest gorilla critters, when I had those in cages, the only way to move them or handle them was to put them in the refrigerator for 15 minutes, right? To, to slow them down by cold so I could lift them out, they'd warm up, and then everything was, was copacetic with them. I came over weeks to value these creatures as absolute marvels of evolution, but more than that, as as exemplars of wildness and ferocity. The gorilla critids taught me some harsh lessons. Each day, I learned how it was that the will to live could transform into the willingness to kill. The gorilla critids never habituated to my presence. Every day was a new attack. And I suppose that was one of my regrets because they're Fear made their lives and my life much more difficult. I remember the day that I injured a large gorilla critted. It, would, it had, in pressing its attack, it had crawled up to the edge of its cage and was, was, was getting ready to, to draw blood. And so I set the lid down and accidentally pinned it against the edge of the cage. And in doing so, I ruptured the abdominal membrane and it fell into its cage and I could look over the edge and see that this fatty streaked viscera was leaking out of its body. And the gorilla critted looked down, assessed the situation, and began to consume its own entrails. And my heart sank. And I knew that I had violated the dictum 
of objectivity because I had actually come in a way to love these wild animals, not a love that we have toward puppies and kittens and these warm creatures that can return our affection, but an empathy, kind of an empathy without pity because I realized that they, like me, were capable of striking out in fear and attacking in anger. And I knew what Walt Whitman meant when he penned these lines in Leaves of Grass. He was referring to animals when he wrote, so they show their relations to me and I accept them. They bring me tokens of myself. They evince them plainly in their possession. And so my heart sank in watching that gorilla critted cannibalize itself. But I heard in my head Dr. Lafage's admonition, their world is not ours, he would have told me. Their pain is a cognitive experience, not a sensation. You cannot know what they are feeling. Of course, that day, I was not just a scientist, I was a human being, and while I could not know scientifically, I couldn't help but imagine what that creature was experiencing. A year after I left LSU, Dr. Lafage uh, was hosting a visitor, a visiting scientist down in New Orleans, and a mugger came upon them. The mugger grabbed the woman's purse, and she became tangled in the straps. Dr. Lafage stepped between them, and he said, don't hurt her, you can have the purse. And I can imagine that he said this with the confidence of a man who understood the nature of violence. And I can imagine what that moment was like. I can imagine the, the grime and the litter in the streets contrasting with the gorgeous ironwork in the balconies. I can, I can imagine that sultry heat of Louisiana with the sort of the limp Spanish moss. I can imagine the fetid puddles, the whiff of urine coming from an alley. I can imagine that trickle of sweat down the small of a back. I can imagine that, but what I can't imagine is what happened next. The man pulled a gun and fired point blank. Dr. Lafage's family and friends struggled to understand, to make sense of what seemed to be a senseless murder. I had no particular insights into the mind of what I took to be the hopeless, poor, angry, inner-city youth. But Dr. Lafage had taught us how to understand some things about violence. He had taught us that violence is a baseline strategy to acquire resources, and this strategy is reduced only when there is a better alternative the better alternative is some kind of a constraint, but these constraints in human beings and most organisms must be learned. Now, and they have to be learned in a viable social system. Now, most humans uh, can acquire the necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, and dignity. They can acquire these without violence. But what that young man needed on that sidewalk, in New Orleans that night could not be found in a purse. It could not be taken at the end of a gun. You see, robbery, violence, is not always about material acquisition. Sometimes it's about power. Sometimes violence is about self-worth. So Dr. Lafage's teachings turned out to be vitally important in understanding what happened, but they were ultimately inadequate. And they were inadequate because a scientist cannot weigh fear. I have no formula to predict when despair turns to rage. I cannot graph the affection of a student for a demanding and gentle mentor. But in the end, Dr. Lafage was right. We cannot truly know the pain of others. And so I leave you with this thought, that perhaps it is good that we cannot fully share in the anguish of terrified animals, dying men, grieving widows, fatherless children. 
or soulless youths. Perhaps it is good. Because sometimes our own sadness is as much as we can bear. Thank you.